Great to be together. Thank you, musicians, for your music this morning. Great to be able to sing those hymns as well. Well, we, uh, as I said, at the end of January, and and as you know, during the months of January, I usually start the year with a bit of a different series than what we normally go through. We will be coming back to, Lord willing, Revelation next week, getting to the interesting bits. It's all interesting, but coming to the... Final chapters, picking up from chapter 17, might want to read on a bit there. But uh, this morning I thought, and as I said last week, I was thinking of finishing the the series last week, but I thought, why not have one more message? And I hope that this morning that we'll be able to consider this as we have been looking at living in the light of Christ's return. And so uh, today I wanted to look at one final command with regards to that. Uh, But before we come to that, just uh, wanted to share something with you, and that is... uh, Don't panic, I'm not going to talk about 5G and all the controversy around it. But there is, um, in fact, quite a bit of controversy around it. You probably have heard different things from that. Um, Probably go, well, what is 5G? 5G is the fifth generation or the the latest technology for mobile phones. And it is uh, different from previous ones in the fact that it offers super high-speed internet connections and as a result requires a lot more towers, it's at high frequencies, promises all sorts of wonderful things and is currently being rolled out in Australia and around the world. I don't know if we've got 5G down here yet, but certainly all the cities have and a lot of people say it's great. You can download stuff really quickly, watch movies, do all that sort of stuff. Um, But uh, there are obviously some great benefits to technology, but there have been some concerns. I didn't want to go into all the concerns that have have come up, but there is one that has just come up in the last recent months and has been talked about in the news, you might have seen in the last couple of weeks, and it's relating to airlines. Now, one of the things that they've discovered is that uh, some of the frequencies that are being used for 5G cell towers and uh, the uh, mobile phone towers and all the technology with that actually infringe upon and disrupt some of the frequencies that are used by airliners for their instrumentation. And uh, that obviously poses an issue. In fact, that has such a great threat that the major airlines in America have gone to the government and said, unless you do something about this, we are gonna have to ground a bunch of planes. People won't be able to travel because there are 5G towers near airports, in airports, offering all this, and those interfere with apparently things like the the ground-based radar and some of the things that actually allow them to make final approach and land safely and all those sorts of things. And uh, so it is uh, some airlines, in fact, some international airlines have already banned flights to certain airports in the US as they're rolling this out and it's proving to be a huge issue. Now, before you panic about Australia, apparently we use some slightly different frequencies. So at this stage, we're not in that sort of danger, although people have said if we expand the network more, we very much could be in that. You know, this has, to some extent, always been a problem. You know that when you go on your, if you've ever traveled on an aircraft, what do they tell you to do? Turn off your mobile phones. And that's because the mobile phone frequencies do and can interfere with some of the equipment with that as well. Well, as I said, why is it such a problem for the airlines? Well, as I said, the frequencies that come in and that are are overlapping and being disrupted are the frequencies that are used for the instrumentation for takeoff and landing. And as you probably know, when it comes to small aircraft, that's not such a big issue. But with large aircraft, airliners, which carry hundreds of people, uh, the pilots, although they have much skill and they're trained and all that sort of stuff, they need their instrumentation to be able to land. They can't just go, eh, looks like, look like 5,000 feet, I'll wing it. You know, that, that's, in, in a pinch, probably they could do that. But you know, their approach, all of the things that are, it's vital that they have reliable reference points. And this is really what I'm getting to. They need trustworthy reference points. They need to trust their instruments. They need to trust what the instruments say. And if they can't do that, they can't land safely and many lives are at risk. And so you go, why do I mention all of that? What's that got to do with with what we're going to look at today? Well, you know, we have the Word of God and we need the Word of God. And just as the disruption of the 5G frequencies to the instruments and the reliable references, there's a lot of noise going on in the world today. And if you just follow that noise, you follow your own feelings, you follow your own desires, then you are going to end up in danger. You're going to end up certainly... um, affecting yourself, maybe affecting others as well. 
And just as pilots need instrumentation that they can trust, we need to have a point of reference that we can trust. And of course, for the believer, and in fact for everyone, the true point of reference is the Word of God. Now we know a lot of people don't accept that, they don't believe that. But we know that in an age of lies and deception, in an age of self-obsession, everybody focused on their own opinions, their own feelings, their own truth, as it were, there is a source of truth. There is a, a, a final source of truth, and that is God, and that is God's word. God has given us his word, and we know that it is true. And it's, it's what we need, not just to, to live by, to have eternal life, but to live and navigate this life. You, you might know the verse in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It guides us, it gives us direction. It is truth, we're told in, in Psalm 119, verse 151. It says, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. And in an age today, like I said, where there's so much noise, there's so many things, so many distractions, we need something we can trust in. We need something we can rely on. And, and we know that we can trust the word of God. And uh, so what we are considering today, and we've been considering throughout the month of January from the word of God, is what the word of God says. Particularly, we know that the word of God talks a lot about, at this stage, the return of Jesus Christ. It's something that we live in anticipation of. Christians have lived in anticipation of that for the last 2,000 years. It is, as one sense, it's one of our points of reference. You know, we're not just going to live out this life and hope everything you know, works out and, and hope everything comes together and maybe if mankind sort of figures it all out. No, God has a purpose and a plan and he is bringing it all together and he's bringing it together in his son, Jesus Christ. And we know that the next uh, event on, on uh, the calendar really for us as believers and, uh, is that Jesus Christ will return for his church, to rapture his church, to take us out to be with him. And then that will begin the final seven-year tribulation period of which will culminate with the return of Jesus Christ and the judgment of mankind. And so we know that that is something that we live in anticipation of. We know that that's something that Christians have lived in anticipation of for 2,000 years. And we're even, as we know, closer to that point than we've ever been. And so um, we have been considering really how that we should live in the light of Christ's return. And we know there's plenty of scriptures that tell us about that. We've been examining some of those and not without, I don't want to go through all of those again, but just quickly, we know that we looked at the first week that we should live expectantly, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. We read in Titus 2 of our God, great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and that that would uh, that we would live by God's grace in the light of his return. We also uh, looked at the fact that we're to live confidently. 1 John 2.28 says that we should abide in Christ, that we may have confidence when he appears. And our confidence is not in ourselves, it's not in our, anything that we do. Our confidence is in Jesus Christ, in, as I said, his promises, his presence and his protection. We also then looked at that we are to live blamelessly that God will preserve us blameless to the coming of Jesus Christ. But really, we're to live this life out now, not sinlessly, we can't do that, but blamelessly in the sense that we live according to God's word and we live in such a way that we glorify God and we, we obey God as much as lies within us and that we do that even when faced with false accusers. And we know that there will always be people that will accuse us even when we do live uh, according to the word of God. Last week, we looked at the matter of living faithfully, that we would continue to trust God and that we would, uh, we would be faithful in the calling that he has us. And we extended that to provoke one another to love and to good works, to not forsake the assembling the ga of, of the brethren. We looked at some of those things. And today, and to finish up, I want to look at this matter, that we should live scripturally. We should live according to God's word. We should desire to know God's word, live in accordance with it, and we should continue to proclaim it to others. You know, God's word, as we know, is truth. It is, uh, is the source of our hope. It's the, the way faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And as we live out faithfully and all these other things as well, we also are to live scripturally. And to take you to a passage related to that, and I've always tried to find, show you passages that talk about the Lord's coming specifically, and this one does again. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 is the passage I'd like to focus on this morning. And it's Paul writing to Timothy. It's some of the final words that he's writing 
and he's giving some counsel to Timothy in, re, uh, in anticipation of his soon departure in execution, but also in the fact of the light of Christ's coming and appearing. Paul says to Timothy these words, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evan an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Well, let's pray as we consider those words and come to look at them this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that uh, we can gather as your people and that we can gather around your word. And Lord, as, uh, just as we've read in your commandment to Timothy and your commandment to us today, your commandment to me even is to preach the word of God. And I pray that today I would be faithful in doing that. I pray that not only would I preach the word, that uh, everyone here would be ready to receive what you would have to say to them. And Lord, that we would realise that, uh, Lord, your word is really our only, only reliable, trustworthy source of truth. And Lord, it's the way, it's by your word and knowing your word that we came to to a knowledge of salvation and it's by your word that we grow and uh, it's by your word that we know that you're coming again and we look forward to the day when that will be and so lord teach us from your word we pray in jesus name amen as i mentioned this uh words that we've just read are part of the final instructions from paul to the younger timothy and these, this is in 2 Timothy. We have three letters that are written known as the pastoral epistles and they're, or pastoral letters. And that is 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus. And this is the older Paul who is in prison, who is facing death. And he's writing letters of encouragement, letters of instruction to a couple of faithful pastors, younger pastors, people who he trained up in Timothy and in Titus. And Timothy particularly is one that he's close to. He mentions in 1 Timothy, he calls him his son in the faith, not that he's his literal son. It's that he is uh, the one that he has really taught in, in, in Christ and that he has ministered alongside and with and trained up. And in fact, in the second uh, letter, at the beginning of this letter, he calls him his dear son. And so really he's someone who he has great, um, great affection for. And he is writing, again, you can imagine that he's writing knowing that he is facing execution for the cause of Christ. He goes on a bit further down in 2 Timothy 2 to say that he, the time of his departure is at hand. And uh, he is really referring to the fact that he knows that he's going to now lose his life. Paul has lived his life in anticipation of the return of Christ. He's often mentioned that, that he's expecting to be around when Christ raptures the church. But he now knows that that's probably not going to be the case. And in fact, it wasn't that he was going to leave this life in, uh, as, as a martyr for Christ, but also not with any fear, because as he says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Paul's not in fear, but he does have important things that he wants to share. And as you could imagine, probably the last things that you would share with a loved one would be probably the most important things. And that's what he is writing here. And he's written in 2 Timothy a lot to encourage Timothy as a younger preacher, a preacher who he has uh, appointed to a ministry to the church in Ephesus. And he's saying, continue on, you know, don't be afraid, you know, trust the Lord. And so much of the letters of 1 and 2 Timothy, we may study them this year, Lord willing, in Bible study, but so much of it is related to the word of God. And he encourages him to be faithful to the word of God and to, you, and to really continue in the word of God. And here we find the instruction that he gives to Timothy. And because it's, it's in God's word, we know it's not just Paul's instruction, it's God's instruction to Timothy. And by extension to us as well, and that is to preach the word. And now the, the idea of uh, 
preaching the word is obviously directed at preachers and so a lot of people when they read these letters these pastoral epistles they think well that doesn't really apply to me but really it's given to apply to all of us and so maybe you're not a, a preacher of god's word maybe you, you are maybe it's something that you desire to do maybe something you've done in the past but you are a hearer of god's word and both this particular passage deals with both the preaching of god's word and the reception, the hearing of God's word. And so we're going to look at both of those this morning. And so some of the things that I'll share in the beginning really relate to the, the command to preach the word. And while that is directed at preachers, we need to understand why it's important, why it's important to the preacher, why it's important to God and to a church, and why it's important to you as well. And then as we finish up this morning, we're going to consider about your a part in it as a, as a listener of a, the word of God as well. God expects you not just to... Um, not just to uh, uh, support the preaching, but to receive that word as well. And so we'll look at that. So if we look back at this passage, it says that Paul gives the command, I said, to, to preach the word. And he gives the reason for that. We notice in uh, verse 1, Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, that means the living, and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Here's the charge, preach the word. Now, a charge, when he says it's a charge, it's, it's, he's basically saying, this is something that I'm urgently telling you. You know, in the, in the um, scriptures, we see things that might be counsel. Uh, sometimes people think, well, you know, that's more of a counsel or suggestion, it's advice. We see an exhortation, something that's a bit stronger. And this idea of a charge is probably the strongest thing you can give. It's, it's a command in essence, but it's to say it's an urgent command. It's a command that has priority. And Paul says to Timothy, he says, the priority is preach the word. Make sure that you give that top priority in your ministry to preach the word. And, you know, that is the real priority for us today in churches, that we would preach the word. Notice here, he's, this, is, this is the key thing. This is the priority. Preach the word. Not feed the poor, heal the sick. They're not bad things in themselves. But preaching the word is the most important thing. Not drawing the crowds, not entertaining the masses. Preach the word. That's what he has told him to do, to preach the word. To preach means to proclaim publicly. To, uh, you want to say publicly in front of others. It's not just something you do to yourself, do yourself in a corner, talking to yourself or maybe talking to one. It's, it's talking to a group of people. And of course, that also uh, involves those people listening and receiving that word as well. You know, God says, in, and Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians, he says that the, the wisdom of God in this world, of, of, so it says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, uh, the world that by wisdom knew not God in their own wisdom, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. What God's saying is, God has chosen preaching in this day, in this age, in this church age, to be the mechanism by which he delivers his revelation. You know, in the Old Testament, yes, God, people deliver, uh, God appeared directly to some people, spoke through dreams and visions and these various things. But, you know, in this day and age, God is, is using his word being preached, the word from this, the scriptures, as the means by which people come to faith in Christ, by the means by which people grow in Christ. Now, we notice here when uh, Timothy says, therefore, we always ask the question, well, therefore is pointing back. So what's the therefore, therefore? And it's really pointing back to the reason why he needs to preach the word. The reason why this is so important. The reason, uh, the priority in preaching the word. And he mentions several things. And it really takes us back to the, the, uh, the chapter before, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, remember that the chapter numbers, the verse numbers, they've all been added in later on. And so we, uh, when Timothy's reading this, he's not going, but, oh, I have to go back to chapter 3. He's just realising that this is a continuation of what's already being said. The reason that uh, Timothy is to preach the word, we're told first, is there's several realities. Uh, firstly, it's in light of the perilous times ahead. Notice in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, This know also, Timothy, right, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And he's saying there are perilous times ahead, and he actually says these perilous times will signify the last days. Now, Timothy lived in those perilous times. We live in those perilous times today. And as we'll see in a moment, they're even greater than they were in Timothy's day. 
and I believe they are one of the indicators to us that we're living in those last days in anticipation of Christ's return. And what he says is that there are perilous times ahead and those perilous times ahead are signified by really two uh, aspects. The first is that uh, there would be this increasing sinfulness of mankind, this self-obsession, uh, this disregard for God, disregard for his word. And you might say, well, that's always been the case. Well, it has, but it's increasing even more. Let's read what it says in verse 2. It says, men shall be lovers of them own selves. They'll be self-focused, self-obsessed. They'll be covetous, wanting things, stuff, other people's stuff. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, speaking against God. They'd be disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Really, no regard for authority. It says, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those things, those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So the characteristic of the day, the last days, would be particularly, says, Timothy, you need to preach the word because this is what it's going to be like. Sinfulness is going to abound. As Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. And we know in the days of Noah, people were exceedingly wicked. We see that uh, this will increase. And I believe we're living, certainly, in those perilous times. And so because of that, he's told that he needs to, to preach the word. Now more than ever, we're living in those ter perilous times and, as I said, we live in anticipation of Christ's return. Well, there's a second part that he says, even though there are perilous times, the, there is some good news, and that is the, he really points him to the extraordinary power of God's word. We go on in verses 14 through 17, and even though it says in verse 13 that evil men will wax worse and worse, he goes on to say, but Timothy, you continue in the things that you've learned. And you've been assured of, knowing who you've learnt them from. And then he goes on to say that from a child you have learnt and known the holy scriptures. These scriptures, the word of God. And he says these word, this word of God is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Christ. Timothy learnt these scriptures from his mother and his grandmother. We read about earlier. And so they taught the word of God to him. And as he knew the word of God, he, we know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And as he knew the truth about who God is and who Jesus Christ is, he placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. And, and, and by that, he was saved. And so that's the power of God's word. The spirit of God takes the word of God to regenerate someone that as they place their faith and trust, that they become born again, new creatures in Christ. But that word doesn't just save people it equips them and it actually matures them and paul was able to attest to that as well remember paul was a pharisee he knew the word of god but you know when he encountered jesus christ on that damascus road he knew the reality of who god is and what he was doing to god he was persecuting him and really that was the the salvation the turning point for paul was then even though he knew the word of god he trusted in the god of the word and the rest of his life was spent um, living for Jesus Christ, proclaiming Jesus Christ, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You notice here he says in verse 10 of chapter 3, you, Thou hast known, fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, persecutions and afflictions. And he goes on, the, so he suffered for the word of God, but he lived the word of God as well. And so the extraordinary power of the word of God is that it can save people, but it also sets them apart for the, his work and really molds and equips and changes people. And we know also that the word of God, as it says here, and we'll come to is in, in, inspired, breathed out by God. It's infallible and it is able to fully equip us for our Christian life. And so these, that's the second reason. Timothy, preach the word because there's going to be exceedingly sinfulness of man. Preach the word because the word alone is, is the power of God to salvation. And then we come back to the first verse in, in chapter 4. And the other reason that he needs to preach the word is because the responsibility that's given to him. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Timothy has been called by God to preach the word of God. 
And as such, he is responsible to carry out that task. Paul the same. Paul actually says that he was entrusted with the gospel. He says earlier in 1 Timothy, he says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, my Lord, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You know, there are some that go into the ministry and, and often when you're thinking about that, as I know in the early days, you think, oh, I might like to do that. You know, it might be something that sometimes people say, I'd like to get up and talk like you do. <laughs> I'd like to do that. I think I might give that a try. Well, you realise after a while that that maybe this, it's not bad to have a desire that way, but ultimately the ministry of the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, with that comes the calling from God himself. And with that comes a solemn responsibility it's something that is serious and you know so um, i know that sometimes people have that idea and it's good that people should desire that but ultimately the there is uh, an accountability that comes with preaching the word of god when you are handling the word of god you are handling the truth you're handling god's word you need to be faithful you need to be accurate to it and so timothy has been told because of that because of the responsibility you're given i charge you to preach it Preach it, as we're going to see, faithfully. Preach it accurately. And uh, we're told that Paul himself says earlier in, in 2 Timothy that he was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So this isn't something that you, know, you just do because it's a, 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 maybe a good idea. It's something that God calls, calls people to do. And God gives pastors and teachers and preachers to the church to equip them, to, to edify them, to build them up. And so it's not that um, a preacher thinks themselves to be any, any more special, any more spiritual or any better than anyone else. I'm a, I'm a sheep like you're a sheep, as well as a shepherd. But, you know, God has given the responsibility uh, to some to preach the word of God. And for those that have that responsibility, we need to understand that with it carries uh, the need to know that we will, be a, we will give account uh, to, to God for the preaching. And so will those who hear the preaching of God's word. In James chapter 1, uh, sorry, James chapter 3, uh, James says, My brethren, be not many masters or not many teachers. He says, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to be condemned by God, but it does mean as, as a preacher, we give account for what we, we preach. And every preacher will do that, whether they're a false teacher and a false preacher or they're one that is a faithful preacher. They will give account to God for how they have handled his word. And we also see here the, the last reason, and that is... Um, the coming judgment by Christ. It says that I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You know, there is a coming judgment for everyone. Romans 14 says, so that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. God is the final authority. He is the judge. And a lot of people don't like that idea, but he has every right to judge. People don't buck authority today. They go, who has the right to tell me what to do? Well, God does. And you will give account to him. Every person will give account to him. And the question we have to ask is, are we prepared for that? Are we prepared to give an account to God? And uh, how do we prepare ourselves? Well, we're told that he will judge the living and the dead. And that judgment will be based on how they respond to and how they receive the word of God. Whether they believed on his word, specifically the gospel of his son, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is salvation in Christ alone. Christ died for our sins, was buried uh, and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Notice it's the word of God that tells us about who Jesus Christ is, what he has done, and we're told that we need to place our faith and trust in him. And so for the unbeliever, the dead, as it were, uh, the dead spiritually, um, they will be judged according as to whether they have trusted in Christ, whether they've received the gospel or they've rejected the gospel. You know, as I said, we give out tracts in this community. We try to, as we know, each of you try to sh have tried to in your lifetime share the gospel message with people you love and, and sometimes that received, but often it's rejected. And you know, it saddens me. It doesn't give me any glee to know that those people will face God 
for their rejection of the message of salvation. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance, all that should come to him. And he's made a way of salvation, and that way of salvation is through his son. There's not many ways of salvation. There's one way of salvation. It is through Jesus Christ. And he has given us the responsibility to declare that, but he's given people the responsibility to receive it and believe it. And so the, he will judge the living and the dead. So the judgment for the unbeliever will be based on whether they've trusted in Christ, whether they received the word of God. The judgment for the believer, we're told that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we're not going to be judged for our sin. We're not going to be judged for our, uh, whether we've trusted in Christ or not. We, when you trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, that comes at a certain point in your life. You place your faith and trust in Christ and you're, you're secure in him. Your sins are under the blood of Christ. But we will, as it says here, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is the term bema. It is the term that is referred to the rewards. And Jesus Christ will evaluate our, not our sin, but our service. He will, develop, he will evaluate how we've lived our lives in obedience to his word and how we've lived to, to serve him. And that will determine the rewards or the loss of rewards. So all of us will face a judgment. And Timothy's being reminded of this. And so much more the, the reason to, uh, to preach the word, to know that we will face a judge. And Jesus Christ, we're actually told, will be that judge. Remember, um, this judgment will, has been committed to Jesus Christ. In fact, in John chapter 5, Jesus says this, For the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all men should honour the Son, even as they honour the Father. He that honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father which sent him. Verily I say to you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, shall not come into condemnation, but has passed from death to life. And so this is the word of God. This is the word of Jesus Christ. He will be the one that will judge. God, specifically Jesus Christ, and when we read here about before God and Jesus Christ, they are one and the same in the fact that Jesus Christ is God, one God in three persons, but all God. And we're told that uh, he will judge the world and he'll do that, it says, at his appearing and at his kingdom. Well, that's the solemn charge for Timothy, preach the word. And let's just focus for a moment on what he said, preach the word, the content, God's word. You know, we are to preach the word of God and preachers are to do that. They're to do that faithfully, but understanding why do we preach the word of God? We'll back up there a little bit. We notice in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And this word inspired doesn't just mean like, oh, you know, God gave me a thought and I had my own ideas and I added them to God's and this stuff. It's actually saying it's breathed out by God. Everything we read here in this word is God's word. It's God's word to us. Now we understand it has been translated and if it's translated faithfully and there are many faithful translations of God's word, but in the faithfulness and the translation of God's word, we read it and we understand it. But it is the word of God. It's not that, you know, well, some parts are God's word and some are not. You know, there's many people today and many churches today, uh, you know, say that. that They go, well, you know, it contains God's word. No, it is God's word. Um, every, every jot, every tittle, every piece of this uh, the Bible is God's word uh, to mankind. Now, some of that word is to specific people. And some of that word is to us. But all of, us, all of it is valuable to us. And so God's word is inspired. We know also it's infallible. Psalm 12 says that the words of the Lord are like pure words tried in a furnace seven times. And he said, goes on to say that God will keep them. He will preserve them forever. You know, I've talked to people before and they say, well, how do you know the Bible's true? You know, over ages, hasn't it just got passed on and modified and passed on and modified? Well, God promised he would keep his word. He would preserve his word. And we can trust God. You know, God has a lot to say about his word in his word. And we trust what he says about that. God's word is infallible. We know that God's word is true. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. And we know that, you know, in an age where everybody creates their own truth and says, well, this is true for me. That's true for you. I'll have my truth. You have your truth. There is a final authority. There is a final truth. And that is God's word. 
And people don't like that. And today, people say, that, you know, I, I don't want to do it. I want to have my own truth. Well, I understand that, you know. Sinful man wants to be as God and wants to have their own truth, have their own universe and their own world. But you know what? You're not God. There is one God. And uh, it's the God that we read in the Bible. It's the God that the living, true and living God. God's word is sufficient, we're told, in 2 Timothy 3, 17. It says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished unto all good works. And the idea of this is that you are completely outfitted for everything that you need. It's the idea that a ship that was completely uh, furnished and outfitted for the voyage it was going on. And, you know, God's word is for us, it's sufficient. It's the fact that it we don't need to kind of go, oh, well, I, I wonder if I've got enough things. I need to go and look at other, uh, other religions, other things and stuff like that. We know that those teachings are all man's teachings. They're all man-made religions. God's word is sufficient for everything that we need. And, of course, God's word is eternal. We're told that uh, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God is eternal. It, it stands forever. You know, that, that's, uh, there's a lot of advice that you hear of in the world and it was like this was the advice 10 years ago and now it's changed and this is the advice five years ago. And we're, hey, we're seeing a lot of that right now in the last couple of years. You know, two years ago they were saying this. Now they're saying this. How, do, how can we trust what people say? Well, you know, we can't. But we can trust what God says. We can trust. We, we can be assured of him. And that's why the word is to be preached. Not man's opinions not man's philosophies, not the next great idea of what someone thinks. No, we preach the word of God. And how's that to be done? Well, he says to Timothy, you know, preach the word. He goes on to say, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And so here we see an explanation of the manner of how you preach. Now, people preach in different ways. Like some people, when I say different ways, some people will preach again, loud some people will preach soft all those sorts of things that's not really what he's talking about he's talking about the manner in which you preach you know he told you to be instant the idea of to be instant is to be ready to be willing to preach the word not oh i've got to do another sermon this week you know sometimes i felt that way when i struggled myself but you know it's good good to, to it's it's a privilege it's a blessing and we should be willing to share the word of god why because it's the word of life as we as we say here holding forth the word of life and it is the word of life. And that means that we are to be instant. Um, it also means that part of being instant, as we'll see in a moment, means to be prepared, ready to preach the word of God. To preach the word of God consistently in season and out of season. Not just, you know, well, and, and, and some churches, well, I'll, I'll preach a bit of a Bible study and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the cricket scores, we'll talk about the latest Hollywood movie, we'll talk about all these different things, we'll talk about how, you know, just some of the things that might entertain you, you know. No, we need to week in, week out, preach the Word of God. And I know for many of you, you know that that's what I, by God's grace, try to do. And sometimes it can be pretty heavy, but we need to continue to do that, in season and out of season. There's sometimes I know where people are really, you know, uh, are blessed by the Word of God. There's times where people have said, you know, this has really helped me and I know that it has helped them because I've seen it in their lives. And there's other times where it's just like, well, I know people didn't probably want to hear that. Um, but, you know, we continue to preach the Word of God. We continue to do that consistently in season and out of season. He says to do that, you do that with power. Now, often people have translated in the past power to preaching really loud and slamming the, you know, the pulpit and all those sorts of things. And, you know, there was a time in the past where people did that, and that was because they didn't have all of this, microphones and all these sorts of things and stuff like that. You think of the Spurgeons in the old times, and they had to, not just preachers, but politicians and everything, they would get up and they would shout and all this sort of stuff because they needed to be heard. And, you know, today we sort of think, well, maybe we need to do that. Now, some people, that's their style, I understand that, but we don't necessarily need to, to holler and shout, but we do need to preach with authority need to preach emphatically. You know, when I get up, if I just share my own ideas, if I share my own opinions, then really I can't preach them with any authority. I may believe this, but you may believe something else. And often today, a lot of people want to reduce the idea of preaching to more dialogue, to more conversation. You know, you can say your bit and I'll say my bit. I remember some years ago talking to a, when I was, just before I was coming to, to down here to plant a church, talking to a, a guy and he was really upset about the fact that he says, well, why is it, and this is a guy that was a Christian, but he was just kind of not really, he says, why is it that, you know, 
Preachers always have to, they, they stand up the front and everybody has to listen to them. Why can't we just put everything in a big circle and all share our thoughts and ideas? And I'm like, I don't want that. Because, <laughs> you know, you share your ideas, I share my ideas. If I share my own ideas, I can't trust my own ideas. But what we're told here is when we preach the word of God, if we are preaching the word of God, it's not my authority, it's the word of God. In fact, we're told here that when it says to rebuke, to reprove, to exhort, that idea is that sometimes that word of God can cut through and can challenge you. Sometimes it is to strongly encourage you. And we actually read uh, further up, and remember that it's the word of God that does that. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You know, sometimes we just need to know what way is right. We don't know, we need instruction. Sometimes we need, we're off track and we need correction. Sometimes we actually need reproof. It's like you are going the wrong way, you need to turn. You ever seen those signs on the freeway? You're driving down and you realise it says wrong way, go back. Well, you, you could get all offended at that. You could get triggered by that and say, well, I don't like that message. You know, I'm just, I just think that that's, that's very offensive. Well, if you continue that way, you're going to be head on into the traffic. You need to obey what it says. And just as those are commands, we know God gives us commands and he gives it to us for our own good. And so we uh, know that we, God's word is preached, is to be preached powerfully. And then finally, uh, or the last couple of ones here, to be preached patiently with all long suffering. You know, for you and I, I don't know about you, I've been, it's now some 35 years I've been a believer in Christ and I've been... I uh, had my ups and downs, I've grown, I've been through different churches and you know it is a process to grow in the word of God. As you sit under the word of God over time you get a greater understanding of the word of God and more importantly the God of the word and it, it really is for us something that we need to be patient with ourselves and those who are preaching the word of God need to be patient with others. You know sometimes as a preacher you get all excited about uh, some truth that you've really discovered or uh, um, really had a better understanding of the word of God and you go around and it's preaching about that and that's really excited about it. you're wondering why, why doesn't everybody get it and you go well it took you a while to get it <laughs> and uh, and reality is we need to be patient and this is why he's saying to Timothy preach with all long suffering this isn't this isn't a sprint it's a it's a marathon we continue on and so for you as listeners that means continuing to be patient and listening and sometimes as that, that, those messages go for a long time, I know, sometimes, sometimes they're shorter. And sometimes we realise that, you know, well, maybe this is not for me right now. But I, how many times I've found when I've heard a message and then a year later I've heard a similar message and it's like it's all new to me because I'm growing in the Lord. And as I grow in the Lord, some of these things, as I read the word of God, it comes to me as well. And finally, we should, it says, with all long suffering and with doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. Doctrine means getting into the nitty-gritty of the Word of God. You know, and Timothy's been told, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Doctrine isn't just grabbing a verse of the day here and a verse of the day there and something that might inspire you, make you feel good about yourself and give you, you know, all sorts of nice feelings and desires and things like that no it's systematically teaching through the word of god you know that's one of the, the hallmarks of faithful preaching that you preach the word of god but you don't just preach a verse here and there it's very easy to say here's what i have to say now let me grab all the verses that support what i have to say that's not expositional preaching that's not laying out now sometimes you have topical preaching i understand that but the best sort of preaching is where we work through a passage as we've been doing today, as we often do, in a work through a book, work through a series of verses, because a verse is part of a passage, which is part of a book, which is part of the whole Bible. And that takes time, and that takes learning, and that takes study. And you know, I'm not saying that everybody has to go to Bible college for that, but certainly you need to spend time in the Word of God. And I find that I'm continuing to need to sit under preaching myself, read the Word of God, read books, and, and also understand the Word of God, pour through it to have a better understanding. If I'm to teach accurate doctrine and doctrine does matter you know the difference of doctrine is the difference between cults and the difference between you know true and faithful um, bible preaching so it's important you know a lot of uh, churches today say oh let's not get into doctrine you know let's just all love jesus let all just let's just all kind of love each other let's just kind of settle all our differences well there's a reason that we have differences sometimes and it's because of doctrine and I understand there's interpretation of doctrine, 
that all of us should be continuing to study the Word of God and, and to, with a desire to come to the truth. And because we have the Holy Spirit in us, He will lead us into truth. And, and we can be thankful for that. Well, that's the charge to the preacher. Right? And one of the warnings that he gives to Timothy is the reason that you need to keep preaching this is there's going to be a change in people. There's going to be a change. And I think he's talking specifically not just about the world in general, but in people in churches. You know, Timothy, you're preaching faithfully now. People are listening. The church in Ephesus was a big church. But, you know, he says there's a time coming where they're not going to. And the warning here that he says is that these are some of the things that are going to happen. And we're seeing this, of course, in churches today. We're seeing this is very characteristic of, uh, of Christianity at large today, is that there is a lack of interest or attention to the Word of God. Give me lots of short stories I can relate to. I don't want to hear doctrine. I don't want to hear all this stuff. That's boring. Give me something that's exciting, something that I like to hear, something that's entertaining, something that's a bit more lighthearted because, you know, hey, I, this is, it's a bit too heavy, a bit too media. I don't like it. Notice he says here that, you know, they will not endure sound doctrine. They want to hear the teaching. Oh, you know, could you make, maybe keep it to 15 minutes? You know, just something that just to pick me up for the week. Well, I'm going to teach the word of God. It's going to take time. He says also there's going to be this what I call selective and subjective hearing. It says he will not, they will not endure uh, sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I don't want to listen to this. I'm going to listen to that. I mentioned last week about you know, really what's happened with the whole COVID thing and the online church and so many people now moving to YouTube to do church or to watch church is that they switch on and switch off or go make themselves a cup of coffee or whatever they want to do because they go, oh, I don't like that bit. I'll wind through it. You know, <laughs> you can't do that with me. You're here. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the reality is, is that people do that or they just say, I don't want to hear this. You know, I want to hear stuff that I like. And of course, there's certain things in, the, in scriptures that we have a passion for, but there's people that just say, I only want to listen to this sort, this sort of preaching. I only want to listen to this preacher. I only want to listen to these things. And they chop and change. And, and as a reality, it says that they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that every teacher is bad there, but it just means that the people are just wanting to hear what they want to hear. Right? But it does go on to say that as a result of that, they will be led towards false teachers. Teachers, and one of the things is, yeah, here, they'll be seeking affirmation. What makes me feel good? That's the itching ears bit, you know. What makes me feel good? What makes me feel affirmed? You know, I don't want anything that should happen to challenge me or make me feel conviction, maybe about things I need to change in my life. And of course, it's, it's the Holy Spirit that takes the word of God that does that. But ultimately, that desire to, to really seek your own truth, your own authority, your own, you know, following the things that affirm yourself really leads to a departure from the truth. Because the reality is if we're going to look at the full counsel of God, there's going to be things that we sometimes need to hear that we don't want to hear. And there's plenty of things as well that are encouraging to us as where we're at. But certainly this lead was a departure from the truth. And so that is the warning to Timothy. That time is coming. Do we live in that day today? Absolutely. Now, and I say that because we have more preaching than we have ever had in history. There are literally millions of hours of preaching and teaching on YouTube on all sorts of different things. And some of it's good and some of it's bad. And probably a lot of it is kind of very, can, can be very deceptive. And that's really what, you know, uh, the enemy is using in this day and age. We're told that these people have the form of godliness. Outwardly, they look very godly. And you might see sometimes you have a preacher, they'll walk around with the Bible and they'll look really convincing and they'll, they'll have a Bible in their hand. And they've learnt this trick. If they hold a Bible in their hand, you think they're preaching from the Bible. But they'll talk about this and they'll talk about that. They'll pull a verse here, they'll pull a verse there, but they'll never actually teach truth. They'll never actually systematically work through the scriptures I'll never deal with a passage and the issues that come from that passage as well. And so we need to be careful of that. That's the warning. Well, what's the response? Timothy, considering all these things, what are you supposed to do? 
change your message, make it more appealing, you know, shorten it. Hey, add a bit of humour, some, some funny little things that we go along with it. Now, I'm not saying that there's times when you can, you know, it can be humour and God's not, doesn't, he's not against humour and things like that. But the reality is, is that what do you do? Well, Timothy, just continue to preach. Continue to be faithful in preaching the word of God. And it says, watch to, to be alert. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. In other words, hey, this is not going to be easy, but it's necessary to continue to preach the word, to continue to sometimes, at, when people don't like it, sometimes you will be afflicted for that. Sometimes you'll be persecuted for that. You know, uh, we live in a, in, in a country today, and it's happening in all different parts of the world, that there's certain passages, if we preach from them, uh, it hasn't happened yet, but legally we could go to jail for them. That's the law. You preach from Romans 1. You preach about homosexuality and some of the different things like that. You know, under the current vilification laws, they could fine you, lock you up. No. We obey God. We don't obey men. You know, we'd be faithful to the word of God. But it can bring afflictions. What does he say? Well, I'll just back off from those. You know, maybe go somewhere else. Don't preach that. Don't preach about those things. You know, it's a bit sensitive. And try to... No, continue to preach the word. Continue the work. Make full proof of your ministry. Well, what is to be the response of the hearer? What's your response to all of this? You've heard a lot of stuff about what preachers are supposed to do. How are you to be respond to that? Well, knowing all of these things, there's some things that we learn from the scriptures as well, that we, the way in which we're to respond to the word of God. Firstly, we're to desire God's word. You know, First, Timothy, First Peter says that we should, as newborn babes, right, desire the sincere milk of the word that you would grow by just like a baby and you know when you have a baby and they they want milk they just crave milk they have to have the mother's milk well that should be the way that we approach the word of god not just something is that we would be like you know what i can take it or leave it i'll i'll just go through life you know god's word is helpful and i'll grab a little verse out of a box or do something like that every now and then look at my poster and that'll be helpful read my verse of the day not necessarily bad, but you know, the idea is that we should devour it, we should desire it. And for that, that means that we should value the Word of God. It's important to us. Well, we should receive the Word of God. James 1.21 says that we should receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save our souls. You know, when it means to receive the Word, it doesn't just mean that we look at it. We don't, it's like saying, well, you know, this is God's Word. I need to understand this is God's word and so therefore I'm not just going to kind of dust it aside or lay it aside. I'm actually going to, to take it in. I'm going to say, God, I've seen these things today. I've heard these things. I, I'm going to receive them as this is something that you want me to know. Uh, you know, often when I get up and preach about things, you know, you think about, oh, what am I going to preach I pray about those things. I, I, I ask God to lead me into what it is that he would have me share for this church at this time. And I know different churches preach different things, you know, unless you're in one of those churches that they all work through the same lectionary and they do all that. No, we don't do that. We, we preach as God leads us through the word. And we do that systematically and methodically, but it's always within mind of what is necessary for the people in this church at this time and what's necessary for me, you know. A couple of years ago, well, nearly, nearly three years ago, we, I, I said, well, I wanted to preach Romans. <laughs> but God says, preach Revelation. Well, that's been a journey and it's still a journey. And we've learned a lot from Revelation, haven't we, particularly with everything that's going on. We're still working through that. And now we're going through Romans in Bible study. But it's a, it's a blessing to be able to do that. Receive the word of God. Believe the word of God. Just thinking before this, you know, Jesus talked about the soils, you know, the, and he said that the good soil is that that receives the word, that they actually receive the word and that they would bring forth fruit as a result. This idea of believing on the word of God is that you don't just think that, well, that, that's okay, that's his opinions, uh, or that's, that may be Paul's opinions. You know, Paul says this, but he was a bit of a chauvinist, so he thought that way. No, this is what... It, no, this is God's word to us. He speaks... He's used the writing of the Apostle Paul, but it's God's word. And we believe what God's word says. If God, were, hey, if God says he made the world in six days, I believe that. I don't have to mess with that and try and go, wow, it could be six million years or six billion years or whatever. No, I believe it. 
You know, God says these things. Um, you know, we often say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, God said it, that settles it. Whether we believe it or not, actually, it makes no difference. But we believe the word of God. Notice here that he talked about the, Seth, Seth, the Thessalonians, the church in Thessalonica, and he says, for this cause we thank God because when you received the word of God, you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but it in, as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually works in those of you that believe. And so we receive God's word as, and we believe it. Well, apply God's word. James, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers as well. And so it's important for us not just to hear it, but to apply it. And you know, it's a, one of the greatest delights for, for me as a preacher is when I see people um, applying what they've heard and learned in Bible study and the messages and things of that to their lives. And that takes over time. But I've watched many of you grow in the Word of God, growing your understanding and really how it's affected your life over these last nine years. And it's just exciting to see that. It's encouraging. It's encouraging, to, that, uh, but it's also beneficial to us. It says, be doers of the Word, not hearers, only deceiving your own selves. If all you do is seek knowledge, all you want to do is know all the doctrines, well, you're deceiving yourself because you're not putting it into practice. couple of final things. Um, how can you really live scripturally? How can you be a good hearer of the word? Well, here's a few things. Prepare your heart. Just a few hints. I think it's good before you come to church on Sunday. If you know the passage, read the passage. Try not to stay up till 3 a.m. the night before because you're probably going to fall asleep in the message. I would. I have. I've done that. Um, and, you know, settle your hearts. You know, the, the last thing that you need is to be in the middle of all sorts of arguments and things when you walk in the door and then you try to settle down with the word of God or, you, or maybe you didn't have breakfast and you're thinking about, oh, I need lunch, I need lunch, I need lunch. Those, those distractions, you know, part of preparing your heart is to prepare to say, I'm coming today not just to come to church but to hear from God, to hear from God's word. Another way that you can uh, do that is to bring your Bible now, I know today a lot of us have, you know, uh, phones and Bibles and stuff like that. I'd suggest to you, go back to the old, good old paper Bible. You know, you can, as I have in this Bible over the, and I've been through various Bibles over the years, you can underline things. Don't be afraid to write in your Bible. I know some people go, oh, write in your Bible. Hey, don't scribble out stuff, right? But, you know, underline things. Draw little lines from here to there. I've done that often. Put a, there's not a lot of room. Some of you have bigger Bibles, you can write notes. But do, do that. You know, this is something that we learn from. This is what God wants us to learn and grow in the Word of God. This is part of the way that we do that. Pray for the preaching and the preacher. This is an awesome responsibility. That's a blessing. It's a privilege. I, I, and I'm thankful that you, you are so patient and understanding. And, and even when I fumble in my words <laughs> and the way I say things... And, Sometimes I listen back to my message and I say, did I say that? I meant this, you know. <laughs> You've probably heard that many times. I think he meant this. Well, you know me. That's one of the things that I like about being preaching in your own church. But do pray for the preaching. Pray for the preacher and the preparation that goes into that. Study God's word yourself. Don't be, as often we can be, the person that comes to church on Sunday, opens your Bible, reads the message, does that, goes and leaves the Bible in the car or in its Bible case the whole week and then just goes, hmm, and then comes back to, to, to next week. You know? Take some time to read, perhaps read over what you've just learned. Study for the word for yourself, but even study ahead. You know, we're going to be in Revelation. Hey, read Revelation 17 and 18. I know it'll do your head in, but I'll be explaining through some of that um, in coming weeks. Um, but, you know, read through Romans, read through some of these things. Be a student of God's word. God wants you to. And then finally, share it with others. You know, one of the best things you can do to, to remember God's word and to God is to, when you hear something, share it with someone else. I don't know how many times I would used to come home, even when I was a new believer and there was no other believers in my family. And, there, you know, all my parents, brother, sister didn't know Christ. I'd come home and I'd talk about the message. And sometimes they'd get upset by what I said in the message, but I'd share that. You know, and sometimes even sharing it with, with each other, it's, it's good to be able to do that. And that's, that's one of the blessings that you know, when you hear the word of God, you don't just keep it to yourself, but share it with others as well. And, and that's a blessing. So 
you know, all of this and all of what we've looked at in January, just in finishing up, is really by the grace of God. You know, we can't do this apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to live in the light of Christ's return. We can only do it in dependence upon God. We can only do it in dependence upon Jesus Christ. And so my hope is, as we come into this year, and we're already one month in, that we wouldn't face it with despair, and we wouldn't just face it with, oh, well, I'll just do whatever I want to do. No, that we should live in the light of Christ's return, knowing that, hey, it could be this year. We don't know. But, uh, but it doesn't whether it's this year, next year, whenever it is, uh, we know that if we're living according to, uh, to his word in the light, in dependence upon him, then it will be a, not only a blessing to us, it will glorify God as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time together. Again, a longer message, but I'm thankful for the patience of the folk. I thank you again just for the, the wonderful word of life that you've given us and that we want to be, as a, our sign says, holding forth the word of life, both Jesus Christ as the word of life and proclaiming the gospel in this community, but also to be faithful in our, our study and also for me to in the preaching of the word of God. I pray, Lord, that each of us would uh, be blessed today by what we've heard to put it into practice and, Lord, that would help us, Lord, as we continue to live awaiting your return. We're grateful for that and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen.